ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಎಜುಕೇಶನ್ ಸಬ್ ಕಮಿಟಿ ಮೀಟಿಂಗ್ ವಿ ಹವ್ ಬೀನ್ ಕಂಡಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಮಂತ್ಲಿ ಒನ್ಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ಸ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ಸ್ ಆನ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ ಟಾಪಿಕ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಇನ್ಫೆಕ್ಷನ್ ಡಿಸೀಸಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಿ ಕಾಲ್ ಇಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಐ ಡಿ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಟುಡೇಸ್ ಮಾಸ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಸೆರಿಮನಿ ವುಡ್ ಬಿ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಅರವಿಂದ್ ರಘುಕುಮಾರ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಫ್ ಇನ್ಫೆಕ್ಷಿಯಸ್ ಡಿಸೀಸಸ್ ಅಟ್ ಗೌರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಮೆಡಿಕಲ್ ಕಾಲೇಜ್ ಟ್ರಿವಾಂಡ್ರಮ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಅರವಿಂದ್ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಟೇಕ್ ಓವರ್ thank you sir so good evening uh today uh, the topic is uh, interpreting clinical science the, the forgotten art you know just like in any specialty the core of id is also about taking a history properly as well as uh, eliciting the clinical science which actually helps us in uh you know framing the clinical syndrome so without identifying or having a idea about the clinical syndrome we cannot choose empiric antibiotics also for you no know, isolation purposes initially we need to have a very good grasp of the clinical science to shed light on this topic we have an excellent speaker dr rajalakshmi she is a senior consultant in id and group lead at hic kim sir trivandra she is uh, trained in both uh, internal medicine as well as uh, infectious diseases uh, she is a fellow from apollo hospitals chennai she has uh, done her observership in transplant id in wayne state university detroit Uh, she is certified in uh, infection prevention and hospital epidemiology she is a fellow of uh, infectious disease society of america she is also the brand ambassador for shia for 2022 she is an avid researcher with more than 40 publications and uh, on top of it she is a very good painter the reason why we chose her to shed light on the topic is the art of interpreting the clinical science over to you madam thank you uh... Darwin and the uh, 6th PGCME committee. My first of all, appreciation for this committee because uh, for regularly conducting a monthly CME, which has actually attracted a lot of residents and with a lot of interactions and uh, definitely a good input and feedback. So please keep it up. And I also enjoy these sessions. These, uh, all these are uh, basics in my life. So uh, the topic uh, that is uh, given to me today is interpreting clinical science the purpose so before i go forward the disclosures and victims clinical science cannot be explained in two minutes let me uh, first disclose that because it's a tough task when i was asked to talk about this topic i initially accepted but when i start preparing this topic i knew that i would be able to finish and i may miss an important clue so if i uh, miss any those important clinical signs please forgive me because it's because of the amount of time or anything that you want to know and the references that i have uh, done is not journal as you know the clinical side is basically davidson mandel and present settle the cases my own and my colleagues great big and this is the history is the most important thing so i'm going to talk about clinical signs as in feel that in id history is the most important so history may point to a single system systematic examination is warranted many times and it is a must may need to review the clinical signs for evolution you may miss the first time but then or during the course of illness especially if the patient has symptoms please revisit the clinical signs to be examined and certain signs may be seen in more than one disease so it may not be cut up in many but it may give a clue so if you put together the history the clinical signs the post and the diagnostics you will definitely get the diagnostic most of the time so i will start with this osler william osler school like the person listen to the patient he is telling him the diagnosis it is not a phrase it is actually a fact and uh, i uh, definitely uh, feel that at least uh, once in your lifetime as a clinician all of us we have missed the clinical diagnosis and then clinical the diagnosis after getting an imaging or a diagnostic test and then when you go back to the patients see the clinical sign will be staring at you so um, it's nothing like examining and finding a uh, sign and then matching so that is a systematic way so uh, how to go about this topic is the most difficult thing i found 
So uh, uh, I, uh, when I went to Davidson, I found this chart, this uh, picture. Uh, so I thought I will go head to foot. And um, uh, I may miss many, most of the organs, but important thing I will try to follow. And uh, we can have a discussion. So I will start with the case of the uh, second home system, a young male with fever, headache, two days duration, followed by all good so You can put your thoughts in the chat box just to be interactive. I will not be stopping in between so that we can cover the cases. So your syndrome will be in acute infectious syndrome. But your differential that should go through in your mind is not only encephalitis, it could be viral or bacterial meningitis, it could be brain abscess, cerebritis, some people will have to be trauma and sinus, either cerebral venous or sinus illnesses. All this can present like a syndrome. And probably imaging may help you with the diagnosis. But the first and foremost will be acute encephalitis syndrome. Soon this patient develops segmental myoclonus in the legs, abdominal dysfunction, myocarditis, and stress problems. And goes on to develop ARDS and diazone data. So any thoughts in your mind, you can put down the chat box so it will be more interactive. So uh, on the next day, the PCR for virus came as positive in the CSM. So at this point in time, there was a cluster of cases happening in Calicut and the possibility of a new viral syndrome was thought in your unusual clinical feature, which is not found in this region previously, and that these patients are rapidly deteriorating the cluster was negative. And it was also made later published as an editorial in the IGCCM by the physician of the initial cases. Later in the clinical infectious disease, this is got published, the clinical manifestation of the virus, who were later, uh, the cases were admitted to the medical process certificate. And what uh, uh, did they find in the first initial presentation was segmental microns. Is segmental microns described in Nippon? Yes, if you look at the Malaysian and Singapore, report, up to 50% cases had segmental microns. And, uh, but strikingly, when you look at the Bangladesh, outbreak, segmental microns was not described not any of the patients were in MRI, and most of them presented with respiratory symptoms. So uh, uh, this is uh, very classically described in the Malaysian Singapore. And these features were found in most of the cases that were found in the Calicut. So the message is, if you find encephalitis, segmental myoclonus, myocarditis, or stress cardiomyopathy with ARPS, respect me. Why? Because the control, the clubbing of all these things uh, signs to form a syndrome it should give a clue to the Why? Because the mortality is high, the CFR rate is in that cluster was 83.3%, and most importantly, human to clinical transmission was uh, happening in 11 of the 12 cases documented human to clinical transmission. So, you, uh, yes, so uh, excuse me, madam, uh, your voice is breaking a bit. Okay, so I will remove the headphone and see. Is it okay? Is it okay now? It's better. Hello? Continue, madam. It's better yeah. now. It's better. Okay. So the clinical clues to encephalitis may uh, be def different based on the structure of the brain that is involved. It can present a seizure or myoclonus and commonly seen in HSV, West Nile, and JE. It can be in the frontotemporal and causing limbic encephalitis where aphasia and personality changes may be the presentation and it is commonly seen in HSV, HHV6, but it, uh, you should also think of autoimmune and paraneoplastic if a patient presents with features of limbic encephalitis. What about basal ganglia involvement? JE and West Nile has a preference to basal ganglia and brainstem features are classically seen in HSV, enterovirus, West Nile and in case of listeria and meliodosis. The training of palsies are much more common in TB and fungal than viral etiology. Agitation, anxiety, hydrophobia, autonomic dysfunction, and features of SAADH are commonly seen in furious babies. Cerebralitis is classically seen in herpes group of uh, infections, including EBV, HSV, viral, uh, zoster, and CMV. And it is also seen in rarely influenza and plasma. Plastic paralysis is commonly seen in West Nile, JE, Enterovirus, paralytic rabies, polio, tick bone, and post infectious. So it is very, very difficult to remember all this. But if you can find that such a symptom is uh, symptom and sign is there in the patient, 
and then club with the other histories and the findings that the systemic findings that you have, probably you will get a clue towards a diagnosis which you can later confirm. So general examination, what are the clues that you should look for are skin rashes, which can present many of the viral infections and some of the non-viral infections, including the plexiosis. Oral ulcers will give a clue with the pangena, enterovirus or HSV. Ocular findings may give a clue to CMV or West Nile. Parotitis, orthitis and oophoritis may suggest mumps or lymphocytic meningitis. So coming to uh, uh, the next organ that we commonly see, not in the OP, but as a referral is the uh, infections that is uh, part of involve, involvement, is, uh, the eye involvement is part of the systemic syndrome or purely an eye and oropharyngeal involvement. So the pink eye as a sign of systemic illness, you may find a variety of illness and it is difficult to remember, but I'll just highlight a few because these are important and you have to consider because these are common as well. Viral conjunctivitis usually occurs as outbreak and common causes are adenocoxacky in HSV. Pink eye with fever and URA, think about rubella, measles, mumps, influenza, and EBV, and look at the oral cavity for ulcers. Pink eye, fever, and rash, you think of dengue, Zika. In Zika, especially, you will find itchy rash, and uh, um, as you can, can see in the picture. And uh, bacterial causes are many, which can cause pink eye. Commonly, it is chlamydia. There are several non infectious causes as well for pink eye. So if you find complex spots, these are small white uh, spots surrounded by erythema, classical in measles, along with red dye and URA symptoms. This presence of complex spots is very, very classical of measles. There are several other signs which you can look into the eye and find out. One is a subconjugal hemorrhage and jaundice, which is very, very classical or lepto, lepto, but it can be found in many of the cases of CLD who has a low platelet and they can bleed into the conjunctiva. Another important sign is subconjunctival fatigue, which, uh, which is uh, uh, commonly seen in infective endocarditis. Endophthalmitis presence as eye pain, decreased vision, hypopion, and this can be either exogenous with following a trauma or an endogenous due to bacteremia, and it can be caused by either bacteria or fungi, including candida. Fundus is a large topic I'm not going to touch upon, fundus examination or the features of fundus today. But what is another important clinical features or clinical syndrome that we find as a referral or you may see in the OP is uveitis. And this picture it beautifully uh, depicts that more than infectious causes, non-infectious causes are very common in uveitis and um, uh, infectious causes amount for most of the posterior uveitis, but uh, rarely do you find an infection, infection is a cause for anterior and other uh, 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 pan uveitis. So if it is an anti uveitis, the common organism is HSV, which is found in 90%. Other uh, viruses like zoster and syphilis and TB can also be, uh, can, all, can also cause anterior uveitis. In posterior uveitis, the commonest cause is toxoplasma and any of the herpes group of uh, viruses can cause acute retinal necrosis, which includes zoster, um, HSV and CMV. And you can find syphilis as a cause in some of the cases. pan is typically seen in uh, syphilis, TB, or due to candida. But remember, in tropical regions, leptospira, leprosy, and chicken kenya can also cause uveitis, and brucella is a cause of chronic relapsing uveitis. Coming to the next common uh, uh, problem that we may see as an inpatient, is preceptal cellulitis and orbital cellulitis. And these are considered as emergency because they present with red and swollen eye. And uh, to differentiate between the two, preceptal cellulitis, usually the vision is normal because this is a, 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 the area that is affected is um, anterior. There is no afferent pupillary defect. The movement of the eye is normal and it is a painless eye, eye no proptosis. Whereas in orbital cellulitis, what happens is there is ophthalmoplegia because the extraocular muscles are involved and there's proptosis and they may present with eye pain. So when do you suspect cavernous signs from the As you can see in the previous uh, picture, so if this eye is affected and this can spread through the cavernous sinus to the opposite eye, the opposite eye can also get affected. And in such cases, what you find is 
bilateral neuropathy. So if as orbital cellulite is present and in 24 hours contralateral signs are seen and you suspect cavernous sinus thrombosis and the spread occurs through the cavernous sinus and you all these cranial lungs that is three, four and six are very adjacent and are close to the cavernous sinus and these are the common ones that are commonly involved. And the organism that can cause this is staph aureus, strep anginosis, anaerobes and GNB. Other cranial nerves can also get involved as I have shown here, the fifth nerve, and it is affected in 28% of the cases. And if this uh, nerve is affected, if sphenoid or ethmoid sinusitis is involved, and the classical sign is absence of sensation of the forehead and cheek. Sometimes you can have a uh, cavernous sinus, thromophlebitis, without orbital cellulitis, in which case the danger area of the face is affected, or it's the dental infection, which is the source. Subacute presentations are very rare and uh, can be caused by actinomyces group of uh, infection and it's often misdiagnosis, Tolosa Hunt syndrome, which is a uh, non-infectious inflammatory syndrome and such patients may end up receiving steroid initially. So this is very easy. I think uh, many can start uh, voting for the diagnosis. Yeah, it is HZO, that is uh, herpes cluster of thalamicus and orticus. The orticus is always called as Ramsey Hunt syndrome. So, uh, herpes also of thalamicus, if it affects the first and second branch of the trigeminal nerve, it can cause the lesions over the nose and the forehead and the eye. And the most important or worrisome thing is the keratitis and loss of vision. If the second and third, that is maxillary and mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve is affected, then you have oral involvement as I have shown there, one half the tongue has vesicles as well, and they can have vesicles over the palate, tonsillosa, and the floor of the mouth. If the facial nerve genital ganglion is affected and where you, uh, you have pain and vesicles in the external auditory canal as well as the loss of taste in the anterior two-third of the tongue and the ipsilateral facial palsy, and this syndrome became more popular when the Justin, uh, when Justin Bieber got affected by this. Again, this again, uh, any of you can try uh, uh, to find this syndrome. It's uh, very, it's not common, but they, uh, this case is very common in our outpatient as well. A patient presenting with severe pharyngitis, tonsillar exudate and palatal petechiae and has a rash with non-tender generalized adenopathy and spinomegaly. And what you find is a periorbital edema. This sign is called Hogland sign and uh, it's commonly seen in IMN and it's actually a pathognomic sign that is described. And um, uh, if you find it's a feature of a pharyngitis with skin rash and adenopathy with this periorbital edema, uh, you should highly think about uh, IMN as a diagnosis and this edema is called a Copeland sign. Such patient may also develop diffuse macropapular rash with ampicillin or related compounds and uh, this IMN as such, it's called mononucleosis like illness, and it can be a presentation of any other infection like CMV, HHV6, HSV1, HIV, and toxoplasma. In HIV, if you, you may not diagnose HIV at this point of time by doing a serology, and you have to do, um, do P25 antigen or HIV RNA to diagnose at this early uh, part of the illness. I will uh, spend a few minutes on acute pharyngitis because it's the commonest problem that we find in the outpatient and it's the commonest problem where antibiotic use is highest. So this 16-year-old uh, 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 presence with fever, sore throat, congested pharynx, tender cervical lymph nodes, will you treat with antibiotic? Is it viral or bacterial? So uh, what is uh, uh, suggested is to follow the center score. I hope uh, most of you would know. Otherwise, you can go through. This is published early in uh, 2004 in JAMA. The, the score is given for each of the symptoms and points are calculated. And age also has, uh, has given a point. And if you have a total score of more than or equal to four, you make a diagnosis of uh, a streptococcal infection causing pharyngitis in, uh, and you'll be correct in more than 50%. And what is advised is you can empirically treat with antibiotic. There are difference of opinion between the two uh, bodies that is IDSA and AAP. They recommend culture confirmation for gas or RADT before you proceed with treatment. But CDC and ASP suggest empirical treatment based on a pharyngitis score alone without microbiologic confirmation. So 
why are you more worried about the uh, gas as it's a group a scrub causing pharyngitis it can cause it can lead to rheumatic fever and center score is more useful to rule out gas so if you are have a negative score or zero or one score you can straight away think about a viral cause and keep a follow up or you can proceed with ra uh, rapid uh, step test if you have a borderline score so with all uh, these features still the positive uh, strep culture from the throat is only 57% and sometimes patient may be exposed to antibiotics scarlet fever is usually seen in children it's again related to uh, group a strep pharyngitis and uh, the, uh, this rash is due to the exotoxin and it is a sand pepper like quality so uh, uh, this is usually commonly seen in children but what is the commonest cause of pharyngitis is viral pharyngitis and this is classically uh, uh, present uh, with oral ulcer so if you find oral ulcer it gives an important clue that it is a viral pharyngitis so if you find oropharyngeal ulcers gingival stomatitis with or without adenophagia which may suggest esophagitis in an young adult please think of hsv as well it may be the first episode of hsv and unless you know the uh, go back go the history of their sexual habits and so on you may miss the diagnosis small vesicles in the of the parents and children it is usually herpandina this enterovirus and majority are caused by coxsackie if you have along with viral pharyngitis a red eye that the commonest etiology is adenovirus and it can happen in outbreaks and it is associated with using swimming pools you can find these oral pharyngeal ulcers with pharyngitis and small ves uh, vesicles on the hands and feet and buttock then it is suggest you have hand foot mouth disease again caused by enterovirus and majority of coxsackie so these are important clues for viral pharyngitis and if you have a other organ involvement you can actually make a, a very good diagnosis by looking at these clinical clues so also remember that some of the systemic virus can also present as viral pharyngitis like ebv and cmv where you will have generalized lymph nodes or rash along with pharyngitis or you may have respiratory it may be due to respiratory viruses commonly due to influenza or para influenza or metanema viruses so to reiterate those suggest of viral etiology the important signs are conjunctivitis coryza cough diarrhea and oral ulcers just like center score that is uh, you can use as a predictive uh, rule for diagnosing group a strep for this viral you can use these findings and if one or more uh, uh, such findings probably uh, may favor viral and you can very well withhold antibiotics and give a follow up and i also wanted to make that that you should remember still that there are cases of pharyngitis with membrane it can be due to commonly due to many causes including strep but you have to remember that there is a condition still that we are facing that is due to cornibacterium bacterium where these membranes are totally i mean it, it looks totally a uh, little different in that it is dark gray and leather like and attempt to dislodge such membrane may cause bleeding and they uh, if they uh, is a large crack the patient can Uh, have progressed to have large nodes in the neck, and they can present as bull neck. And uh, this member information is uh, a result of local toxin, and the nodes are reactive. So, if the large nodes, they can progress to respiratory distress and even death. Also, remember there is a group of uh, young people presenting with pharyngitis. You have to keep bronchial pharyngitis as a baby, uh, and uh, just like HSV. but there won't be any oral ulcers and it is a milder form of group a strep that is what the clinical picture is so unless you ask for other history you may easily miss this diagnosis atypical bacteria are rare cause of pharyngitis and in such cases azithromycin may have a role but we rarely diagnose nor we do we focus our treatment on that coming to the next interesting syndrome that each one of us in our id would have seen uh, and this is elemia syndrome which is caused by fusobacterium necrophorum and it is an oral anaerobe it mimics group a strep just like it presents pharyngitis and initially there may be some improvement but later on the patient presents with dry gut peritonsillar abscess jugular thrombophlebitis and septic pulmonary emboli and also embolic to the distant organs like spleen they may have respiratory distress as well on clinical examination if a patient who has pharyngitis also have tenderness and swelling in the neck as well as induration along the jugular vein or the stenocleid master you have to think about lemias and do appropriate imaging and uh, actually uh, decide on the antibiotic choice because you have to give an anaerobic oral anaerobic cover the choices would be amoxicillin or ampicillin cerebrata 
Moving on to the lung, it's a, a big topic by itself, but uh, I think I will touch upon only this acute interstitial pneumonia caused by this organism. By looking at these pictures, I think it is an easy clue to the organism that I'm going to talk about in this slide, that is mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is one organism which can present in uh, so many extra pulmonary manifestation, systemic manifestation, and the ex uh, pneumonia can be very, very, you know, it may not be very visible and the patient may not be having a prominent respiratory symptoms. So they may initially even present with these extra pulmonary symptoms. So you have to be very careful and maybe do an imaging to diagnose sometimes because they may not have a classical signs and symptoms of pneumonia initially. So they can affect, this manifestation can affect any organs from skin, lungs, and heart, central nervous system. They can present as encephalitis. They can present as rhabdomyolysis, arthritis. They can present as Raynaud's glomerulonephritis, and they can have a lot of hematologic involvement in the form of hemolysis, etc. So these are produced by, these symptoms are produced mainly by the IgM antibodies, which are called actogenins. And remember, these antibodies are first seen in the first initial week of the clinical illness, where when the pneumonia may not be that evident. So later on, you may find a pneumonia and, go, uh, and you may diagnose all this uh, after, after putting, putting all together. So uh, Raynaud's and hemolysis may be the initial presentation also. Going on to the another system, this is a, a case by Dr. Uh, who was recently seen by Dr. Nias and thanks for him, to him for sharing this case. So this case is an interesting case uh, and it is a clinical diagnosis. So um, it, anyone can try this. So this patient presents a month ago with this uh, um, small pustule, which was drained, it is, as you can see, it is on the thumb. He has, uh, underlying, he has underlying chronic liver disease. And a month later, he presented with a stroke. And at that point of time, uh, another abscess was noted uh, in the middle finger. So he is a, a patient with chronic liver disease. He presented with low grade fever and digital abscess. And this abscess pus was drained and it grew effect. Callus and he was treated with cefepirifum sulbactam and clindamycin, which is not the drug of choice for that organism. And two weeks later, he presents with embolic stroke. At this point in time, another pulp axis was noted in the middle finger. And at this point in time, blood group effect callus. He was also noted to have hematuria and proteinuria and acute kidney injury and a suspected glomerulonephritis. nephritis. So, um, and on auscultation, he has a early diastolic normal in the left sternal border. So what you find is tell safe signs of IE and he does, he does not need an echo to fulfill the IE criteria, though he may need an echo to uh, rule out, confirm the diagnosis, to rule out complications and plan surgery. So if you look at the Duke's criteria, which is the criteria that is used for infective endocarditis, for definitive infective endocarditis, you need a clinical criteria, which is two major or one major and three minor. And if you look at this patient, he had enterococcal uh, bacteremia, which is community acquired. Yes, he fulfills one major criteria. He also has a di early diastolic murmur, which is a, probably a new onset. He has minor criteria, which is fever, major arterial emboli in the form of stroke. He has gain lesions, which you see in the hand, and he has glomerulonephritis. So he is a confirmed case or a, a, a clinical criteria. He is a not a possible, it is a confirmed case of IE. And later on, it will show vegetation, diotic valve, and there are several other features, peripheral signs that you can find in IE, unless you look for, you may miss all this. These are petechia, which is commonly seen in the conjunctiva. Rot spots are seen in the fundus. As you can see, these are oval, pale, and uh, retinal lesions, which is surrounded by hemorrhage. And it is not uh, only found in IE, it can be seen in severe anemia, leukemia, and SLE. So it is not pathognomic of I uh, just few differences between ocular nodes and Janeway lesions. Ocular nodes are small, painful nodular lesions, and these are commonly seen in parts of fingers and toes. And uh, these are evanescent and disappears in hours to days. Whereas Janeway lesions are hemorrhagic, painless macules seen in palms and soles and persist for several days. So uh, you, uh, the also node are usually seen in subacute, not in acute case of IU. So it presents in subacute forms, but this embolic phenomena can occur any time, and it also depends on the size of vegetations and more commonly seen in staph aureus. So uh, as I said, this is an immune-mediated uh, 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 
pathology the ocular nodes so it can be seen in other condition like sle marantic endocarditis similar to any one bone focal infections as well whereas this is classically seen in ie with septic emboli and commonly due to staph ie but other than murmur all other features that is peripheral signs of endocarditis are you know, seen less than 25%. So unless you carefully look for, you may miss it. And this is uh, on searching 2,700 patients with IE, definite IE, they found that these signs are less common to the tune of 5% to 26%. Coming to a similar picture, but a different etiology. If you look at this, this patient presents with low-grade fever, arthritis, and skin lesions. And these skin lesions are hemorrhagic, necrotic papule, and also noted to have acral PTK. So it is, what is this syndrome? It is an arthritis dermatitis syndrome. We also noted to have uh, multiple pustules. And on his uh, taking history, there was history of urethral discharge. A punch biopsy of the lower leg is confirmed, blood cultures were sent, urethral culture was also sent. And in such culture, we also sent for a, a combined bonococcal chlamydia probe for nucleic acid test or the STD panel and a syphilis screening. And in this patient, the urethral uh, culture, I mean, uh, gram stain show gram negative cocci. And later it was confirmed case of disseminated bonococcemia. So any arthritis dermatitis syndrome with a history of urethral discharge, the, uh, the, uh, the confirmation, the, the syndrome actually is a classical sign and it is noted in 86% of disseminated gonococcemia. And the triad include cutaneous lesions, tenosynovitis and joint disease, and joint disease can be migratory, asymmetric polyarthralgia or oligoarthritis presenting as septic arthritis. So uh, you have to keep this in a, as a differential for all the mono, uh, mono septic arthritis. Cutaneous lesions can be very, very variable and most common are papular pustular lesions. Cultures should be obtained for all the mucosal surveys, including cervix, pharynx, rectum, and urethra to improve your diagnostic yield. And the differential for such syndrome would be endocarditis with septic embolization, which you saw in the previous case, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, secondary syphilis, and there is some entity called, uh, one entity called chronic meningococcemia, which is very rare, and, uh, and, and several other non-infective causes. So coming to the more uh, classic presentation of this syndrome, I think uh, you can all try to guess what are this picture. Yes, it is meningococcemia. So uh, meningococcemia is called the story of Dr. Guy, Jekyll and Mr. Hyde because like Dr. Jekyll, the, there's a common common cell in the fat, nasopharynx, quietly lying there. But if it is uh, an invasive, it can behave like Mr. Hyde, that is, it can cause purpuric crash, purpura fulminance, necrosis, and gangrene. And in very severe cases, it can cause DIC and uh, bleed into the adrenal uh, glands, causing Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. And it's, uh, this is due to rapidly increasing bacteremia and the endotoxin that is associated with. This is the, uh, the endotoxin called as LOS. That is um, the protein. In such cases, the protein uh, C and complement deficiency. Also, there is a, a, a deficiency, and such patients uh, tend to have a very severe disease. But this patient was lucky, it, it was a confirmed case of meningococcemia, but then uh, he underwent aggress aggressive therapy, uh, and uh, uh, but he ended up losing his limbs, uh, and then later replaced with processes, the nose was reconstructed, and now he plays football. This is again a similar picture, but a different diagnosis, as you can see, this is classical, called as libido reticularis like picture, and this patient also has gangrene or ischemia involving the ear lobe, the legs. And this was reported as related, uh, related to Rocky Mountain spotted fever and was published a few years ago. Um, it was uh, uh, in our hospital by uh, uh, Dr. Anu, Dr. Matthew Thomas, Dr. Herschel, and they found that there's a clustering of these cases. They present with vasculitis gangrene and it's an, unknown, it's an uncommon complication of Rocky Mountain spotted fever. 
all, all these patients have severe sepsis and multi organ dysfunction and were diagnosed by using immunofluorescence assay. And they noted that there is a four fold raise in IgM titer. And they presumably this was caused by Rickettsia conoris species indica. Under much similar syndrome, but a different totally different presentation is this male who presents with one and a half months of diarrhea, intermittent fever, light loin pain, and weight loss. And he also noted that have rashes, which is purplish, and which was initially thought to be vasculitis, and he ended up developing hypoxia and noted to have eosinophilia. So, because of his hypoxia, he underwent ex initially X-ray and then the CT, which shows interstitial pneumonitis. So, what is this syndrome? This is very classical, and it is known as Leofler syndrome. There are several etiology for causing this syndrome. And that is uh, grouped under pulmonary infiltrates with eosinophilia called the Pi syndrome. And this patient has this pulmonary eosinophilia, infiltrates with eosinophilia. And in addition, they all, he also has chronic diarrhea and rash. And what could be the possible etiology? His stool. He underwent, because of the chronic diarrhea, he underwent stool examination, which is shown here, as well as he underwent duodenal biopsy. Both stool and duodenal biopsy revealed strong alloids. Blood culture blue, clips yellow, and he also noted uh, developed further developed meningitis and CSF culture grew efficia. So remember, the strong alloids, the larvae, when it migra migrates, it penetrates the intestine. And there is a bacterial gut translocation happening constantly in such hyperinfection. And this can cause a bacteremia, spontaneous bacteremia, just like in SBP, uh, in CLD patients, and it can also result in meningitis. So this was a case of strongloids hyperinfection, which was later published. Coming to other infection, that is skin and soft tissue infection, which is again, uh, is an important infection for all ID physicians and the physicians. And this patient presents of a minor trauma present with cellulitis. As you can see, he has erythipulas like lesion with generalized erythema over the adjacent area. This is another case who presents with uh, post venectomy cellulitis in the leg. So, this patient, the first case who presents with minor trauma and cellulitis, one hour later, there is hypotension, multi organ dysfunction, and underwent fasciotomy for necrotizing fasciitis. And the gram stain of the tissue fluid is shown here, as you can see, it shows GPC in, ch in chains and the fluid and blood group streptogens. So this is classically a toxic shock syndrome because this patient also has hypotension. The drug of choice is penicillin. Clindamycin is added to reduce the toxin. IVIG has a role in trap related toxic shock syndrome. So this is the toxic shock syndrome definition. And if you have a blood or any other site which is involved growing a strep, uh, strep pyogenes, in addition to uh, uh, the patient should have clear hypotension and two or more of the following findings like renal impairment, thrombocytopenia, liver involvement, and a generalized erythematous rash and necrotizing fasciitis. So any two of the, these features, in addition, the patient should have hypotension and strep pyogenes grow. So this patient that we have discussed in the previous cases uh, fulfills many of the findings and is a classical case of toxic shock syndrome. So toxic shock syndrome can start as erysipelas as shown here. They go on to develop cellulitis and deeper uh, um, regions of the skin is involved and can result in necrotizing fasciitis. And many a times they need the Brightman source control to reduce the progression and to, uh, 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 so, and, and as a source control. This is another case of serious uh, skin and soft tissue infection. A 62 year old male presenting a severe pain in the left gluteal region and upper part of the thigh since morning. There's no trauma, backache, or undue exertion. So, initially, he was seen in the emergency and, he was, seen, uh, uh, and um, he was given some analgesics. The pain doesn't improve and he then proceeded for imaging. And three hours later, since because of the excruciating pain, a re examination was done which shows edema. Brony induration, published discoloration, and even crepitus. So this is a classical sign of bedside. The Bredman was done, and patient developed refractory shock and death. And this is classically a case of a gas gangrene. As you can see, the brony induration, the swelling, the published discoloration, all is 
suggesty with a crepitus all suggesty of a very rapidly progressing myo uh, myonecrosis classically seen in gas gangrene later on his blood culture group clostridium septicum and is a later confirmed in maldi so this is a case of clostridium myonecrosis which is spontaneous onset because there was no history of trauma and it is due to clostridium septicum and it differs from pathogens which is usually followed after trauma so septicum occurs spontaneously it is hematogenous seeding from gi tract in a known or undiagnosed adenocarcinoma of colon this is a very good chart which is uh, published in idsa uh, guideline so for a management of ssda if anyone can apply this it is easy to follow and even diagnose so uh, the last two cases that we discussed belong to this non purulent uh, cellulitis which started as erysipelas and then progressed to cellulitis and enough so it belongs to severe category and such patients what the first line is surgical debridement which is the first most important thing to do and then empiric therapy which should include piperacillin tazobactam with vancomycin and then follow up with culture historical clues to specific diagnosis will include it could be a, a trauma it could be a, uh, exposure to sea water it can be exposure to river water uh, and then it can sometimes be polymicrobial especially in diabetic individuals so some 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 other case scenarios which uh, actually are new mediated which you should keep in mind is case 1 is a tender indurated cord like nodules which is seen on the thigh and the skin biopsy showed polymorph polyarthritis nodosa and the second case is a palpable purpura which again biopsy proved that it is uh, 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 cryoglobulinemia related and there were uh, immune fixation direct immunofluorescence reveal uh, complements and uh, um, antibodies so both these were clear cut case of chronic hepatitis b later on their antibodies were positive and uh, the, the and the, uh, these features are suggest of a deposition of immune complex causing cryoglobulins uh, cry cryoglobulins on the endothelial surfaces if you look at there are several other extra uh, hepatic manifestation of hepatitis b the commonest be hilang dictyria mixed cryoglobulinemia and polyarthritis nodosa which happens in up to 35% as per this literature and most of them are responsive to hepatitis b treatment this is another clinical scenario where you may find in your icu this is a 65 year old may lady recent stroke received aspirin losartan and betalactam and two days later developed a diffuse rash which is erythematous which is dusky and Uh, there are a lot of eroded surfaces are ruptured bullae with this formation and uh, uh, most important the oral and vaginal mucosa is not involved conjunctiva is also spared when you uh, examine this patient palpate this patient the top layers of skin slip away easily when rubbed and this is classically known as mikolski sign so the patient was uh, uh, underwent a biopsy to print the diagnosis and it showed subcorneal splitting pharyngeal swab through mssa and it was diagnosed as a case of scaldus uh, skin row and the close differential diagnosis where you find nicol's case is tem but this age is not classical and adult is not a classical case for uh, staff scaldus skin syndrome and it usually affects children and they do well uh, if appropriately managed so uh, the other name for scaldus skin syndrome is ritter and the ten is called the lyle syndrome so what is the difference in both they can have fever and malaise and they can have mikolski sign but uh, the ritter involves usually neonates but ta can affect any age and it is infection preceding in ritter that is pulpit drug in ten and the mucous membrane of not usually affected in scaldus skin syndrome whereas in ten classically the mucous membrane will also be involved and uh, there's he the, all these uh, scars heals without scar but in tn it is little more deeper and there is a scar formation tendency and the treatment for scar disease syndrome is antibiotics for staph or is usually and for tn it is to stop the culture drug and support it care okay so coming to another scenario umbilicated papules what should come your time the first thing is to rule out hiv because this is a close dd that is happening uh, three important differential diagnosis that should come we find umbilicated uh, papules especially uh, it is generalized and more often seen in the face these are 
molluscum contagiosum fructococoma, and thalloromycosis, and these are commonly seen in HIV population. This patient had a, a low CD4 and a high viral load, and he uh, also underwent serum crack test, which was positive, confirming that it is cryptococcoma. So the next thing that we should do is to rule out cryptococcal meningitis. So he underwent CSF, which was negative for cryptococcal uh, meningitis, a culture and crack was negative, and CSF cell count was normal, sugar and protein was normal. So this is a case of cryptococcemia and presenting as cutaneous cryptococcoma, and he underwent treatment and he improved well. This is another interesting case, but a, a, a different site presentation is at a different site. This is a necrotic lesion as with fever, and he comes from, she comes from a rural background. So initial diagnosis was vasculitis, like any of the uh, 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 granulomatous lesion that is uh, affecting the central part of the face. Can be due to infection. The common infection of staphylococcus, pseudomonas, anthrax, and fungal. But this patient also had thrombocytopenia. He ended up in bone marrow and it was diagnosed, she was diagnosed to have AML. The culture from the necrotic tissue group, pseudomonas. Now you have the syndrome and the clinical diagnosis and it's classically a thyma gangrenosa. This is not the usual site. It is usually the extremity, but it's a rare site of a thyma gangrenosa affecting the nose, presenting as the necrotic lesion. Last few slides, I will end the session with addressing the tropical infections and the classical signs. So a right foot swelling, this patient present with right foot swelling, redness and paresthesia and numbness of three months. Swelling of left foot patch, numbness of two months. Swelling on the right hand, erythema, numbness, extending below the elbow on the needle aspect of one and a half months. So what is this syndrome? This is a syndrome of mononeuritis multiple. So once you make a syndrome of this, you should have a differential diagnosis. I know that currently common is one of the commonest causes diabetes, but still in India, you have to keep it another important differential diagnosis. This patient also had this erythematous lesion with raised borders, reduced sensation, and also had thickened palpable ulnar and lichen peroneal nerves. A nerve conduction study was done, which showed mononeuritis multiplex picture. Biopsy was done of the nerve and uh, it shows perivascular granuloma, epithelial histiocytes, AB was positive, nerve was surrounded by inflammation, granuloma, and was confirmed case of Manson's disease. And uh, what is the reaction that he has present? He was presented with a reversal reaction. It was identified as type 1 reaction based on the features that he had. He didn't have fever. In type 2 reaction, it, the systemic features are more and the presentations will be different. He had reversal reaction, increased erythema, warmth, and edema. And um, sometimes it can present with ulceration of the lesion, as well as increase in swelling and tenderness of the peripheral nerves. So the final diagnosis was borderline lepromatous leprosy with type 1 reaction. Again, this is a classical sign called the chick sign or the brawny nose post chikungunya. Scaly macular hyperpigmentation, where the tip and the bridge and all of the nose are affected, and it is usually seen in the centrofacial part. There is no mucosal involvement in such cases, and this is called a post inflammatory hyperpigmentation and it causes for months. This FAINS criteria again, you should know what is FAINS criteria, which is applied for leptospirosis diagnosis. This not only includes the clinical criteria that is. Uh, described here like fever, headache, myalgia, and conventional execution. And the points are given for all this, but it also includes other criteria which I am not discussing here, which includes uh, exposure risk as well as the lab test. And with applying this, your probability of diagnosing leptospira or ruling out is high. And not, but not the last, but not the least, uh, who will, uh, would not have missed an SCAR in their life. So please remember, these are found in the moist and covered areas, axilla, inframammary region, and the groin. So unless you examine, you may miss the sign very well. So there are a lot of other signs which I will not be discussing because of want of time. But anyone can take this question that I have posted here. It is not the uh, real quiz time which you are going to get now. But then you can see all these questions and you can put in the chat box, tripod position, usually seen in epiglottitis. Haman sign, usually seen in diastinum, where you get a crunchy sign. Morphe sign is classically seen in biliary infections, so it's a cystitis. Chocolate triad is seen in cholangitis, where jaundice, fever, and chills are common, or striad. 
Reynolds Penta is if cholangitis patient develops hypotension and shock, it is very, very, uh, very uh, specific for uh, cholangitis. Which your cortis syndrome is seen in uh, bonococcal infection presenting as abdominal pain, right upper cordon pain, and classical of perihepatitis, and the Dowie abdomen, classical of TB peritonitis. So, there are several, several other syndromes and signs. And uh, I think uh, I, I have not done uh, justice to the topic, but uh, there are plenty to uh, discuss as well. But due to time constraints, I will um, end this talk by this one more oscillatism that is who studies medicine without books, sales, and uncharted sea. But who studies medicine without patient does not go to see at all. But the best of his quote is medicine is learned by bedside and not in classroom. Let not your conception of disease come from words heard in the lecture room or read from the book. See and then reason and compare and control, but see first. With that, I will stop this discussion and we can um, be open for discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Madam, for the, the excellent lecture. Actually, uh, it, it was very, so wonderful just, you know, taking us, uh, you portrayed the entire beauty of clinical medicine in a limited a span of time and all the participants were eagerly you know posting on the chat box when you are display, displaying all, all those uh, wonderful cases and all but i could not find any questions on the chat uh, if any of you want to ask directly you can do so unmute and do so everyone is just uh, posting there thank you madam excellent madam etc <laughs> okay thank you very much madam for the excellent lecture do you want to add anything more, madam? No, no, I think there are uh, many things that is uncovered. I know that, but then uh, due to time constraints, I have to restrict, sorry. <laughs> but uh, I think I uh, uh, actually clear, getting all these cases, pictures um, is, uh, I mean, uh, it's more rewarding and to share these pictures and actually discuss cases based on these images is uh, actually very nice than uh, going on as a journal discussion. So totally a new topic that is given to me. Thank you so much. I enjoyed as much as <laughs> preparing as much as others. Thank you very much, madam. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, uh, we will uh, go directly to the, the photo queue session. And uh, before we move, just a small announcement that uh, please uh, click on the link in the chat box, which is for a survey on how you feel that this uh, PG subcommittee ID masterclass is going. Uh, just, I request all of you to please click on the link and uh, complete the survey. Just take uh, a few seconds. Uh, sorry, Doctor, please go ahead. No issue, no issue. Uh, you can also uh, make the housekeeping announcement regarding how to answer the questions. You know whether they should answer yeah. it together. So we, we we will have three questions, right, Doctor? Uh, yeah, three questions. Three Each questions. question will be having three parts. Three parts. So we what uh, we will uh, look we will look into the winners and we will be. Uh, you will be asked to type the questions in the, the answers in the chat box. Please make sure that you answer each of, uh, answer them together. No, do not answer them after the first question is finished. Just make sure that all the three questions are answered at a, at a stretch in the same at the same time. The person who is answering them first will be announced, and we will give away the prize. Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Uh, Ma'am, regarding the first case of Nipah virus, uh, uh, I don't think that uh, triad or uh, uh, quadrat you explained can we make a specific for Nipah virus. Uh, other uh, viral encephalitis syndrome can also present with same findings uh, pertaining that uh, Nipah virus is a very dear syndrome. Uh, outside Kerala. Yeah, I agree. See, encephalitis, segmental myoclonus, you can definitely think as a so many etiology. But if it presents with autonomic surge and myocarditis and ARDS, please keep NIPA as a differential because of high attack rate, high mortality. That's what I would like to come from. Segmental myoclonus was not seen in the Bangladesh series. So I'm not telling that. But if you put these three things, what are the other differential diagnoses that you would get? Most of the encephalitis presents at, uh, as uh, a single organ involvement, and uh, rarely they present with 
an autonomic surge, only few hardly rabies like syndrome presents with autonomic dysfunction, FADH, and several other involvement. But with this syndrome of segmental myoclonus with a autonomic surge, I think you should keep NIPA as an important differential diagnosis. We may be missing some cases, NIPA may not be rare, and it may be spreading because it's a zoonotic disease. So uh -huh. it should be a differential. Do you have anything to add on? Yeah, others, please Dr. Alvin, are you there? Yeah, I also got uh, <laughs> muted. Okay. 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 So, can we move to the quiz session? So, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, I, my time. video video is also the host uh, has stopped my video also. Okay. I'm also trying to unmute, sir. Like, I didn't know. Uh, sure. Uh, can you enable screen sharing? You are able to share your screen, sir? You should be able to share your uh, screen now. Yeah, yeah, now I can. Yes. Okay. So, uh, we will uh, straight away go to the 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 QS part. So this was the, the question in the flyer. So a 45 year old uh, fisherman rescued from sea during cyclone Oki, presented in shock with history of high grade fever, omitting excruciating pain and swelling of both legs of two days duration. He had been stranded at sea for four days and had sustained multiple abrasions on both legs. On examination, both lower limbs were swollen, tender with multiple hemorrhagic bullae, as you can see in both the pictures. And you can also see on the uh, on the side of the board, some organism is attached. So the first question is, what is the causative organism? The second question is, what is the probable source of infection? Third question is, the same clinical picture, if the patient is presenting with the same clinical picture following Exposure to brackish water. What is the likely causative organism? So I will read the questions once again. What is the causative organism? Second one is, what is the probable source of infection? Third is, the same clinical picture following exposure to brackish water. What is the likely causative organism? I will go to the next question. If you listen carefully to Madam's talk, it will be pretty easy. A 15-year-old boy presented with fever and sore throat of five days duration. On examination, bilateral painless upper lid edema without conjunctival congestion was noted, along with tonsillitis. Investigation showed mild transaminitis. So you look at the picture, you can see the, the bilateral upper lid edema and if you are looking at the tonsils, you can see a, the membrane. This membrane is tonsillitis. 
So the question is, what is the probable diagnosis? That's the first part of the question. Second is, which test is used to diagnose this condition in the first week of illness? The third one is, name the clinical sign, that is bilateral painless upper lid edema without conjunctival congestion. What is the name of the, the clinical sign? So first one is, what is the probable diagnosis? Second is, which test is used to diagnose this condition in the first week? Third is, name the clinical sign, which is the bilateral painless upper lid edema without conjunctival congestion. I'll move to the last question. A 50-year-old man with history of recent international travel presented with fever, headache, cough, and rash. Now look at carefully at the morphology of the rash. Okay. The clue lies in the, the morphology of the, the rash. You can also see the enlarged view of the rash. The question is, what is the diagnosis? This is question number one. Second is, what is the drug of choice? Third question is, name the vaccine which can be used for post-exposure prophylaxis for closed contacts or unimmune. First question is, what is the diagnosis? Second is, what is the drug of choice? That is, name the vaccine which can be used for post-exposure prophylaxis. So that is the end of the quiz and all of you can submit the answers. Dr. Nitin, just say when I should uh, say the answers when they have finished submitting. Okay. So we will wait for 10 seconds. Sure, sure. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Rich, can I think you can reveal the answers. So the first case actually is a real life case. The answer is uh, Vibrio vulnificus. Now during uh, Cyclone OK, this uh, uh, fisherman got stranded in the sea. So in order to prevent them from being uh, taken away by the monstrous waves, they tied themselves to the side of the boat. The side of the boat will be having this, the crustacean. This is the barnacle. So barnacle will have high concentration of Vibrio vulnificus. And uh, since they are tied to the side of the boat, the both the legs had so many abrasions and this organism entered through the abrasions and led to this necrotizing fasciitis. So the answer is Vibrio vulnificus. Source of infection is from the, the, the mollusk or the barnacles. And third one is, even though Vibrio vulnificus also can grow in brackish water, the same clinical picture can occur in Aeromonas hydrophila also if the exposure is to brackish water. Now going to question two, the probable diagnosis is uh, Epstein-Barr vir virus related infectious mononucleosis. Test in the first week is going to be Epstein-Barr virus PCR. And uh, the clinical sign, as uh, Madam has uh, clearly explained, is the Hogland sign. And uh, importance of this sign is that 10% of cases of IMN, you can see this sign if you look very carefully. It is very transient. It usually occurs prior to the onset of membranous tonsillitis. In this case, you can see the membranous tonsillitis, which is described in IMN as well. Usually, one of the features which helps us in differentiating diphtheria from, from IMN is the presence of transaminitis. Usually, in diphtheria, the transaminitis won't be there. And third question, the, the clue lies in the morphology. So, the answer is actually chicken box, varicella zoster, because you are seeing the pleomorphic lesions. You are seeing the macular lesions, the papillar lesions, the vesicular lesions, as well as the crusted lesions at the same in the same image. Usually in monkeypox, all the lesions will evolve together. So you will have the macular lesions and all of them will progress to the papules at the same time, will progress to vesicles at the same time, pustules at the same time, and will crust at the, the same time also. 
So this is a chicken box, drug of choice, a cyclover or various cyclover, and the vaccine which can be used for post-exposure prophylaxis is actually varicella zoster vaccine. So that is it. So uh, I think, uh, Dr. Arvind, nobody has answered all the nine questions correctly. So I can't say that uh, we don't have a clear-cut winner, but uh, I will uh, choose the first two who has uh, answered maximum right. So yeah, sure. first one is uh, uh, Dr. Bishal Gupta. He's the one who has answered most of them right, except for saying uh, uh, VZB PCR. He has written mono monospore test and uh, he's written saline water. I think that we can take that. Okay, uh, that we can take. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rahul Garg. Okay, okay. Uh, Bishal Gupta and Rahul. These are the two winners. Congratulations to the winners. Did any, yes. anyone give the answer as uh, monkeypox for the last one? Lot of them have given monkeypox. Okay, that is actually the, the take home message. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you should not be missed by an international traveler. You should, uh, no, clinical examination means that you should know, look at the patient very carefully, examine, examine the morphology of the rash, etc. Okay. So I, I request winners to please uh, type their mail IDs in mm -hmm. the mailbox. Before we close this session, and also uh, click on the link to do uh, the survey. Uh, Dr. Bishal and Dr. Uh, Rahul Gand. I think we can close this session, uh, Dr. Rahul. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, number is there, sir? Or you, uh, Nitin, you can close it. Then. Okay, okay. So I think I, I'll thank everyone. I also request before we close the session just to click on the link so that you can complete the survey and uh, we will get your feedback and uh, probably make ourselves much better than uh, what we are going through. And uh, uh, I thank you all. Uh, we will soon message you regarding the next webinar and see you there. Thank you, Dr. Arvind, for the present, uh, for taking the taking the uh, webinar, and uh, Dr. Raji Lakshmi Manan for taking the beautiful lectures which she did. Thank you. Thank you. Good show. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah.